I'm Carrie McDougall. I'm the interim chancellor at Penn State Beaver, and I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Um, as many of you know, The Current is an ongoing series of engaged events to help thought leaders like yourselves, I'm going to label all of you thought leaders, um, to dream, envision, and work towards a more purposeful future that benefits us all. This is our second year of Penn State Beaver and Riverwise partnering in The Current um, to foster these events and discussions. We pride ourselves on these events being engaging, meaning that you're not just sitting passively as thought leaders, but they're actually engaged um, in talking with us. So tonight we're also partnering with the Genesis Collective under the inspiring leadership of Pamela Rossi Keene, so we're really excited about this trifecta of partnership. Um, as a land, you can sit wherever you'd like. As a land grant university, um, it is our mission, it is Penn State's mission to serve the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and even more so to serve our county. Um, so I'm so glad to see our auditorium being used in this way, and to see all of us gathered here tonight to learn more about how to vision. Um, how to create visions for the, for the county and move them forward, and how the arts can help us um, in creating visions and strong communities. Now, I'd like to introduce the amazing Danny Brown, who is the Director of Community Sustainability at Riverwise. Danny, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, my name is Danny. I work with Riverwise. If you're not familiar with Riverwise, um, we do uh, community development work really throughout the whole county. Um, our whole idea is we want people to work better together. Um, and so doing so by empowering people to find their voice so that they can make changes that they want to see in the community. So not just changes that you personally want to see, even though that's great, but what we all collectively want to see as a whole. Um, you know, more vibrant community. Um, and so this event is super exciting and it's been such a, so fun to partner with Penn State um, to really have an opportunity for people to talk about what does the future of Beaver County look like? What could it look like? Using our, our imagination, using creativity, using the arts, um, having really incredible speakers come throughout this several months we've been doing this has been really exciting um, for Riverwise to be able to be a part of this. So, yeah, if you have any questions about Riverwise, uh, feel free to ask. I'm just super excited to be here. And I'm excited to introduce Pamela Rossi Keen with the Genesis Collective. Welcome to this small but mighty crowd. Um, Part of building a thriving community is connecting the public with art and creativity. And that's what the Genesis Collective is about, and that is what this evening is about. Through our connections with Robert Morris University, we connected with Kevin Schreck, a documentary filmmaker who is currently serving um, as the Fall 2023 Visiting Documentary Filmmaker for the Arts and Humanities Department and the Center for Documentary Production and Study at the School of Informatics, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Thank you, yes. Uh, Kevin Schreck is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and film educator who focuses on nonfiction storytelling. He studied at New York's Bard College. His first major feature-length documentary, Persistence of Vision, was an award-winning documentary about the journey of master animator Richard Williams and his 30-year quest to create his ultimate ill -fated, ultimately ill-fated magnum opus, The Thief and the Cobbler. I watched this over the last couple of days, and it's very riveting. Um, archival footage can be riveting, and you're about to see that. Uh, Persistence of Vision screened at nearly 100 international film festivals and other venues of five, on five continents to virtually universal acclaim. Kevin's second film, uh, Tangent Realms, The World of C.S. Coastman. Is that right, Kevin? Thank you. Uh, Coastman is a feature-length documentary about the art and personal evolution of Turkish surrealist visual artist C.M. Mimo Coastman. And I'm sensing a theme here with your your fascination with artists. Uh, he is currently in production on his third major project, project, Inongo, a documentary animated hybrid and portrait of a young rapper, producer, PhD candidate, as is typical, um, Inongo Lumamba Kasongo, better known by her stage persona, Samus. The documentary will be the first feature length film with an animation team composed entirely of black women animators, helping to tell Inongo's story in their own unique styles. Kevin's next film is, currently, is, an, is a currently untitled documentary about a scientific research expedition around Antarctica. Will there be art featured in the film? Nature is the artist. Nice, Kevin. All right. <laughs> 
set to begin filming mid-2023. Tonight, we're screening Persistence of Vision, and then we are going upstairs to have refreshments and a great discussion about the film and Kevin's work. And that will really be led by um, our local filmmaker, Christopher Padgett, who works closely as a storyteller with Riverwise and also as a storyteller with the Genesis Collective. So they will be able to talk craft and you will be able to participate in that conversation. We're really excited about it. So right now I'd like to introduce Kevin Schreck um, and you're gonna tell us a little bit about your film and lead us into the screening. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you to, there's a huge cast of people that made this possible. Robert Morris University, Heather Pinson over there, um, Genesis Collective, um, Riverwise, uh, Penn State Beaver for providing this really nice auditorium, and especially thank you to people who chose to come out to see a, a documentary on a Wednesday night, uh, which is on a very lovely evening. It's, um, I appreciate that you all are at least curious enough cinephiles to check out something that a little off the beaten path on a very beautiful autumn evening. Um, so um, Pamela already gave a great uh, intro to this, um, but just for further context, um, the main presentation we're showing tonight is what was my first film that, that was released uh, 11 years and one day ago, it had its world premiere. Um, and uh, it's uh, actually a student film run amok. Um, I made this as my graduation piece, and then um, a few people told me, you know, you could possibly show this at festivals if you wanted to, and I kind of rolled my eyes, and they, they offered to supply the screening fee, um, you know, coverage for that. And lo and behold, it gave me a career. Um, so it is a little bit uh, rough around the edges, I, I think, based on what my technical and aesthetic capabilities are today. But I'm really thankful that even after 11 years, people are still fascinated by this story for um, largely the same reasons that I was so compelled to make this film, that nobody had ever... It's one of the great um, overlooked um, stories in cinema history, but it's such a, a, a magnificent and enormous story in cinema history also. Um, and as was also sort of described in the intro, um, you know, there, I guess there's a theme of sorts. Um, so we'll show Persistence of Vision in its entirety, and then immediately after, you don't have to leave your seat right away, because we'll do um, a, about a 10 minute preview of Inongo, the, the next film I'm working on. Um, and it'll include footage that actually nobody else has really seen. Um, so you were kind of the first people to see some of this new footage. We did a five minute preview uh, a couple of weeks ago and it went over so well that I kind of for greater context decided to expand it a little bit and just see how that tests in this space. Um, the film is close to wrapping up, but I'm eager to show a little bit of it and to further the conversation. They're very different films in some respects. One is a documentary about animation. The other one, as you'll see in its fragmented form, um, is a documentary that utilizes original animation. One is about someone who uh, lived and worked in Europe. The other one is someone who lived and worked in uh, North America. Very different generations, very different backgrounds, very different media that they work in. But I think that there is some commonality between the two and, and maybe some sort of universal commonality that perhaps says something about the human condition. That sounds really pretentious, but I think that's what we're all trying to get at, right? When we're making art is something that connects the people. So even if cartoons or hip hop or surrealism is not necessarily your thing, I think that the right stories hit with people in the right way for the right reasons. And you can find something that you weren't expecting to see, but that you, but that you connect with in the best of those stories. And I'm. I guess I'm just trying to make my contribution to that continuum, to that, um, to that tradition. So thank you all again for showing up. Um, there's also some DVDs and Blu-rays if you want those after the show, but I think you want the refreshments even more. So stick around after uh, the feature and the preview of the forthcoming film, and we'll have a nice uh, discussion and some snacks and things to have. All right, thank you everyone.
right. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming and showing your film. Uh, I'm Chris, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I, I do community documentary work in this area. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I was watching your film for the second time and I'm, I was just, the first thing that I think about, I guess, when I, look, when I watch your film, besides just like the intensity that, that Richard Williams had and stuff like that is probably that you had to have some kind of similar intensity with the archival yeah. footage and things like yeah. Like I think, I, I guess I wonder, could you share like the story of what, what it was like for you to even like think, start thinking about this project? Well, um, I was always interested in animation. I dabbled in it a little bit in my teens, stop motion. And when I was 11, I asked professional animators, where do you start if you want to be an animator? And they all unanimously said, get Richard Williams's book on how to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it had only been out for like a year, but it was the go-to tome on how to animate in any medium. And I just mm -hmm. devoured it. I learned a lot. I learned what not to do, what to do, how to, you know, and uh, different techniques. And uh, it was clear that the guy knew what he was talking about, but I, would, I wondered to myself, how come I only know that his name from Roger Rabbit? Why don't I know, like, you know, why doesn't he have like 20 or so feature films to his name mm -hmm. if he knows his stuff so well? And a few years pass, I go to college, and someone tells me about this lost masterpiece of animation, this unfinished magnum opus, which perked my ears up, of course. And uh, it was the sort of fan edit or unfinished version of The Thief and the Cobbler. And even in its unfinished form, I was just really blown away by the level of detail and the fluidity and the personality of, of it and everything and all the design. And um, then I saw that <coughs> name again, <coughs> Richard Williams. And then I was like, wait a minute, I know that name. And I made the connection to the book. And I was like, that's why he doesn't have 20 feature films with his name over like a 30 year career. For 30 years, he was working on one big film, essentially, with a lot of little side projects and commercial work, too, of course, but one titanic project over all that time. And um, as fascinated as I was by The Thief and the Cobbler itself, I was even more interested in Richard Williams. It was this sort of operatic story, you know, this mm -hmm. sort of rise and fall, and had a clear, like, three-act structure, and uh, this sort of Greek tragedy kind of thing. And um, I became, it was contagious. I became obsessed with the story of obsessions. So I just dove right into it. It became a hobby of mine, crazily enough, just to learn about it. And uh, by the time I had to kind of come up with a senior project for my, for graduating uh, from Bard, um, I had pretty much done over two years of development and pre-production on my own. Hmm. And, you know, I actually had other ideas, but I'm glad that I pivoted to making Persistence of Vision because it was sort of like um, I didn't know if I would, I knew I wasn't really pre prepared to make it, but I was ready to make it. Hmm. There's a difference, I think, maybe. And I was like, I could, you know, maybe there's going to be probably some copyright issues or this and that because there's so much archival, but mm -hmm. if I get a cease and desist slap, you know, I can at least say, okay, fine. It was, a, it was an academic exercise. It was a homework assignment, hmm. essentially. Not a big deal. But that never happened, weirdly enough, and we followed mm. most copyright to a T, actually, and uh, fair use and everything. Mm. Um, and it did the exact opposite than being shelved as a, as a homework assignment. It, was, it flourished, and it snowballed into this career, and mm. it's still showing, I mean, <laughs> today, so mm. uh, literally. So, um, yeah, it's, it, and, but, uh, so there was some archival drifting around, but a lot of it I had to dig up as I was interviewing people, too. Hmm. Um, really, it wasn't until we got to, we as in myself and my friend who was the line producer, Sarah Taylor, we went to London for two weeks in August of 2010 to shoot those interviews. And, you know, the Brits are very, you know, we North Americans are very hyperbolic and expressive. Mm -hmm. But in England, they're very reserved and, you know, cautious and one of them one of the interviewer one of the animators we interviewed said oh um by the way i don't know if this is of any use to you but um i've got some old animation stuff on pneumatic tape i can have it transferred for you to a digital format if you'd like and i said sure why not it turned out to be over two hours of pencil tests and rough animation that nobody had seen in over hmm. 20 years wow and once we had it was like it was like you know this ark of the covenant kind of thing but not as dangerous <laughs> um it was uh you cracked it open and just like then i knew we could like, we had the interviews which was useful but it's a work of visual art too the documentary itself so hmm. you need that visual evidence so once we 
found that. It was like this treasure trove that opened up, and then I knew we could actually like make this into a documentary. You visually. said that was footage of not just pencil tests or, or pencil All tests. different stages. It was like looking at like, you know, the fossil record or something. You saw the growth of everything, all these different strata. You saw from hmm. stuff from the late 60s and early 70s and the late 80s and early 90s and the character designs would change, the work hmm. would become more complex and fluid and technical. But, um, you know, there was artwork from people who had passed away long ago and from different countries and but uh, yeah, it was just that that wasn't everything that you saw in the documentary, but that enabled a lot of stuff to happen. And um, we were also lucky that, that any time that Richard Williams was interviewed for a television documentary in, in England, he would kind of do this P.T. Barnum thing and get on his soapbox and pitch The Thief and the Cobbler just in case some wealthy potential investor was oh, okay. watching. He'd always have his spiel um, while he was being interviewed about something else, something that he considered more mundane. Hmm. So. There was enough of that from like 1966 to about 1991 that it carried almost the whole story and took us where we needed to go. It's, it's pretty interesting that you have kind of like this, <coughs> this record and, and at, at the front of the film you say, you know, that he refuses to talk about it and yeah. stuff like that. And I, I, want, I wonder, I'm sure other people wondered like did, if, if you know if you ever saw this film or, or if you ever did make contact with him. So uh, I knew that he would say no from the get-go. Um, we attempted to reach, but it didn't really work out. Um, and I honestly felt a little affected by it. I was like, oh, I don't really want to be harassing this old guy who just wants to be left alone. This tragedy befell him. And I was almost thinking of just like not making the movie. Just as, and, but we were in the midst of shooting in England, and so Sarah, my line producer, was wisely caught me in my tracks and was like, no, we, we, we raised almost $10,000 to get here. Hmm. We have two weeks of interviews to do across, you know, the UK. Uh, we're only three days in. Every, like you knew Richard Williams would say no. Everyone else has said yes, please tell this story. Hmm. We're making the movie. Hmm. So she was right. And um, so we did. And uh, I made it and you saw it. But um, I still felt compelled to at least give him a chance. So I, I sent him a screener of it because I knew he had an office in Ardman. The, that's the animation company that makes, um, they're in Bristol and they make um, things like Wallace and Gromit and Chicken Run and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Really amazing stop motion films. And um, so he had an office there as sort of like their guru on the mountaintop, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. They like, he was like their, their mentor for free and they just gave him board to work on his stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so Persistence of Vision came, I never hear, heard back from him after I sent the screener, but I felt it was just fair to put the ball in his court, you know, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I released the film in fall of 2012, and then a year later, in late November, there was a semi, it was, it was publicly announced, but it wasn't really advertised. It was this weird thing that they were going to show the work print of The Thief and the Cobbler, the version of the movie before it was seized from him, hmm. so incomplete, but all of his and his team's artwork, none of the other lousy stuff thrown in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, and he would be there, not for a Q&A, there would be no Q&A, but there would be an intro by him live. And um, I actually got to go to that, and I respect, you know, I, I wasn't going to be one of those fanboys and storm the stage and whatever and say, oh, I'm the guy who made Persistence of Vision or whatever, I'm the obnoxious, plucky American who mm -hmm. did this, no, it's like, I just wanted, it was his moment. and. Um, it was great. I mean, everyone, all of animation royalty was there. It was very full house at the Academy in L.A. And uh, the standing ovation was like 10 minutes long or something. Mm. It was insane. Um, and then I thought that was it. And then a few months later, he had another screening at the BFI. So it's like he was sort of trying things out, testing the waters. And there was a Q&A for that event, apparently. I wasn't there for that one in London. But um, multiple independent sources told me that somebody, and I have no idea who, it was not a plant, somebody asked, what do you think of that documentary about you, Persistence of Vision? And allegedly what his response was, was, well, I like the title, which is great, because <laughs> titles are a weakness of mine. They're like my Achilles heel. That's a good title. He liked the title. It's a double entendre. He said, I like the title. Um, uh, I haven't watched it. I don't know if I ever will watch it. But, you know, if it wasn't for that work and the interest of other people, I probably wouldn't be here today talking about this film. Hmm. I never thought I would again. Um, so that was nice that he saw a silver lining in my unauthorized biography and d 
didn't really want to strangle me or anything. Mm -hmm. he, he saw that there was some good. And he passed away just three years, uh, four years ago, I think. Um, <clears throat> and um, uh, swiftly, peacefully um, at home um, and uh, had made progress on his final piece. And it's some of the best work that ever has been done in hand-drawn animation. It's, and it was released as a short, not, a, not as a complete feature, but it's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing one camera movement, all hand-drawn. There's only pencils. There's no ink. There's no computers at all. Um, it's called Prologue, and it's, um, it's, it's an amazing and brutal anti-war film. It's a completely different genre from anything else he's made, mm. which was the case of everything he made. It was completely different from anything else he ever made because he would never wanted to do the same thing twice. Hmm. Um, so, uh, yeah, he, his, his arc has a good ending. Um, and it's nice that he didn't feel any, at least publicly, wasn't upset with what I did. Hmm. Um, so I never, I, I never met him. I never talked to him. But hmm. we were, I think, on OK terms. And that was OK. <laughs> that was good enough for me. I never needed to meet him. It wasn't, I'm not really a fanboy like that. I just, yeah. it was just good that there was peace. Mm -hmm. You know, hmm. so when when you think about like, <coughs> and you kind of were talking about like his arc as like a, as an artist, yeah. um, and and I think we talked about this a little bit before, mm -hmm. um, before we screened your film, kind of like similarities that you have with your artwork and maybe how you gravitate toward <laughs> artists. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Toward, yeah. I wonder when what when you're when you're thinking about doing a documentary or or your, or something is. Um, kind of starting to percolate in your brain like what what kind of things kind of gravitate you and, and what do you look for in storytelling Ooh, um, well I've kind of inadvertently made a trilogy or am in making I guess a trilogy of films about artists uh, making because the Yanongo film has not yet been released <coughs> we just need to animation is nearly finished and we're you know we're uh, uh, we just needed the, the, the third act, basically, in the mm. can. Uh, it's nearly there. Making a movie about a traveling musician when there was a pandemic happening globally is not easy. Mm -hmm. So it's been kind of on ice for a while, and we're just waiting for the right moment to just finish it up. Mm. But, um, yeah, the other two, I mean, it's, it's always a different continent. It's a different person. It's a different art form. It's a different uh, sort of genre of documentary. Um, or mode of documentary, but there's definitely a, a through line. Um, I don't know, maybe, I, I th I, I'm starting to suspect that every one of the films I've made are in some way autobiographical, even though none of them are about me, and I try not to be in my films as much mm -hmm. as possible. Like sometimes you see documentaries where the filmmaker is part of the narrative or seen or heard mm -hmm. um, in the piece, and sometimes that works. Uh, sometimes it works very well and is appropriate, but I, my, my opinion is if your subject is way more interesting than you are. You don't need to be in the movie, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and I always find interesting people, I think. And um, people then, you know, I, there's always this, I was talking about this with Heather, actually, like, I, I wind up making, a, I love films about artists, but there's a lot of films about art and artists that I don't like because they kind of fall into these categories that I kind of tentatively describe as either coffee table book movies or fanboy movies. Hmm. And for me, coffee table book movies are kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's their portfolio hmm. put onto video. But that would be more appropriate as a coffee table book or a gallery hmm. than a movie. Like, wh why is that a movie instead of a coffee table book, yeah. you know? Um, the medium is the message, the context that matters and everything. And then the other one I, I dislike even more, which is the fanboy movie, which is 90 minutes of people just going on and on about how wonderful somebody is, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, I don't even know if I can take that for five minutes, <laughs> let alone 90. And, uh, and it's not because I want to take anyone down or make them look bad, but it's because human beings are complex creatures. And, um, you know, uh, it's so easy to kind of just have the honeymoon phase when you find someone that you're inspired by or respect a lot, like mm -hmm. Richard Williams or like, you know, Memo Kozman who's become a friend of mine and is the Turkish painter in, in that film. And um, Inango I've gotten to know too. And these are all people that I, whose work I really admire and whose um, zeal for their craft and life I really admire and their um, tenacity I really admire. But you have to be observant and respond that sometimes 
human beings are flawed and complex mm -hmm. characters and complicated characters. You know, they sometimes are self-destructive. Sometimes they're their own worst enemies. Sometimes they make mistakes. Um, um, so I think it's important to include that if you're trying to do a real grown-up portrait. I don't know if I fully answered your question, but well, <laughs> so you, I, think I think you did. I think also I, I was struck by how you talked about like there was maybe like a thread you were noticing that was autobiographical. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm sure that like like in, in my own work, I like there's there's subjects you choose. Mm -hmm. There's there's choices you're making all the time oh, in, yeah. in the editing of what you include, what you feel like is important. What yeah. and I wonder if you kind of like could say more, I guess, about like how you feel like it what resonates with you, I guess, when or in that autobiographical way? Or um, okay, let me see if I can figure it out. Uh, <laughs> or maybe, I, no, or no, maybe no, this it's, is a, it's, it's ten school years me. It's maybe I should, no, yeah. It's, yeah, let's, let's try. Uh, well, I think, I mean, I made Persistence of Vision at the end of my college career, and I hadn't, I'd, I'd been making movies for fun when I, since I was 10 years old, but mm. this was the first, like, big deal thing in mm -hmm. terms of scope, in terms of run time, in terms of the amount of work involved. I mean, I had to go to a country I'd never been to before to make it. I, I spent years on it rather than just a few days, like, mm -hmm. like when you're a little kid and you're making a video. Um, and uh, I think Persistence of Vision, its autobiographical angle is, it's sort of me asking what am I getting myself into? Because hmm. it's like I would love to be someone with the sort of creative prowess and ingenuity of Richard Williams, and but does that mean it comes with the negative stuff too? Hmm. Does that mean is there some sort of curse that comes in that package where you kind of become very myopic, very obsessive, kind of self-destructive, kind of alienating while seeking perfection? Is that ne does, is it necessary to be that person while trying to be the other one? I don't know, but hmm. it was sort of me figuring out like I don't know if I could ever be as big of a deal as. Richard Williams, or make anything as special as that, but I know I'm going to come into some challenges along the way. With, with, mm. with Tangent Realms, I think that film was like, you know, I'd had Persistence of Vision had been out for a few years, and, you know, it had shown well, and Tangent Realms, I kind of made art for art's sake kind of mm -hmm. thing, like just for myself. I knew no one would ever really care about it or see it or anything, but I had to, it was even more ambitious in some respects because I had to go to Istanbul to film it, but also, it was just me on the crew. It was just a smaller project, even though mm -hmm. it was more involved. And there was also no clear story at first because it was a contemporary uh, thing. Mm -hmm. like with Persistence of Vision, it's all historical. Mm -hmm. It's clear to how to plot that out. But I had to just see what story revealed itself to me with Tangent Realms. So I think that film is more about... Um, uh, if, if, the, if the previous one was, what am I getting myself into? It's more like, okay, but what am I actually doing here? Like, mm -hmm. what, what is... And not just like making that artwork, but how to, how, what, what, what am I actually doing as someone in their late 20s, early 30s at the time like I was, and uh, with relationships, with paying rent, with, you know, having uh, savings, with uh, being creatively satisfied, with being economically responsible, with hmm. being romantically involved, like what am I actually doing here? Hmm. Um, and then I think Anango is kind of a, is, because we're the same age about, she's a few years older than me, but um, she's another 30-something millennial who's trying to keep her head above water in mm -hmm. early 21st century America as a creative person. And I think that film is kind of about, okay, I'm actually doing it now. Like, this is happening. Hmm. How long can I do Is this sustainable? How long can I do it hmm. for? Like, is it, because even the filmmaker Werner Herzog says in the, his penultimate chapter of his Masterclass video series, he says the average lifespan of an independent filmmaker is between 10 and 15 years. Hmm. I am 13 and a half years old. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a senior citizen in the indie, independent filmmaking world, and yet I'm only 30, 34? Yeah, 34. Are you feeling your age with the... <laughs> yeah, I guess, but on the other hand, it's, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, so I, I intend to keep doing it because I like doing it. It's the only thing I really know how to do. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, I want to keep doing it. But, it. but there's always that question of, can you keep that roof over your head? Can you be satisfied? Will anyone, and I think that's the other thing too, is like, will anyone care? Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe you'll be like, oh, look at this precious little wonderful thing I obsessed over and spent tens of thousands of dollars on and years over. But is anyone else going to really care? You know? 
That feels like feels like a familiar theme that you just described as in the movie we just watched. Yeah, that too. Well, I guess yeah. there's overlap. There's yeah. overlap. So maybe I'm making the same movie over and over again. <laughs> well, it's just interesting with different people. It sounds like like well, a lot of what you're exploring is like almost like the relationship artists have with art and like how they yeah. navigate like you know the like in the film Richard Williams he's like he's doing this commercial work and he's talking mm -hmm. about how he's like using it to fund his personal projects and things like that. And I, 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 w I was, was curious, like your thoughts on kind of like all these different relationships that people have with art and I, I maybe don't have a good <coughs> question, but it's like for, there's a, a wide range of artists for like s small towns all the way up yeah. to, and trying to navigate how to do something they love. And I guess we're all trying to do it, but yeah, yeah I don't know if you have any thoughts on kind of like, the artists that you've documented kind of like, is this a life that like, seems like a good life, I guess, for a lot of people or, or one that they feel like they're able to communicate and share? Well, what's cool about art production is it has the potential to be immortal, you know? Like you can, you can make something and, um, you know, if we're lucky what we've got maybe 70, 80 something years on this planet. Um, but if the technology and the infrastructure and the civilization and the interest is, persists, um, you could make a statement or <coughs> express an emotion or tell a story in a song, in a poem, in a movie, in a mural, in a symphony, in whatever you choose, a photograph. That could outlive you and it can permeate. You know, mm -hmm. Other people can listen to that track uh, that you've composed, those beats. You know. Other people can share that image on the internet. Other people can be in an auditorium and watch that film. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I think that's kind of the allure of it, whether we, and that's actually a theme that shows up a lot in Tangent Realms, is that the, the character Memo is, seems very fearless, but he's actually very afraid of what he describes as entropy, just like everything eventually decaying, and he wants to fight against it. He wants, he really wants something to just, that he's created to just remain as long as it can. Hmm. And um, I don't know, I think that's, that's what's great about <clears throat> theater is that it's very organic and it's, you know, uh, ephemeral, mm -hmm. you know, like there, you do a performance and it's gonna be complete, not completely, but it's gonna be different the next night. Mm -hmm. um, and you can never really capture that again. And filmmaking is like, when it's done, it's done. Um, but there's also this weird sense of permanence to it also and it's, then it's no longer yours once it's out there. Mm -hmm. it's, now it's up to other people to decide whether it has any monetary value or any mm -hmm. critical value, artistic value and there's a pressure involved with that mm -hmm. of like you don't really want your, your, your baby or whatever to be like sc scrutinized mm -hmm. and criticized um, but at least it's a way of expressing something that maybe you're not better at in, in other forms. Mm -hmm. You know I feel more at home doing it through movies. I guess. Why, why documentary <coughs> filmmaking? Well, um, I, the main reason is uh, I think some of the best of fiction is based on nonfiction. I mean, sometimes when you hear a, a story and you are, believe it's true or you find out that it's true, it somehow becomes better. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure why that is exactly, but it just, it just becomes more exciting to know that these real engaging narratives are out there and these real engaging people are out there and stuff. Hmm. Um, and also it, it, it's just, it's pragmatic too. I mean, I've always, it's always been the aesthetic reason that I just described that made me want to do a documentary, but I'm glad mm -hmm. that it's, I'd rather that I'm more interested in making documentaries than say $100 million budget mm -hmm. science fiction or fantasy films. As much as I enjoy seeing those kinds of movies, that's a lot harder to make. Mm -hmm. you, you know, getting decent actors and getting believable special effects or you know, uh, um, a, a, a appealing set design or costume design or whatever it is, hmm. that's a lot more difficult than the production values that are attainable through documentary. There's, um, and you get that sort of grit and you get that sort of authenticity. Hmm. It's always a tricky word with documentary authenticity, but you know, it's not a bunch of green screen. It's not a bunch of uh, people putting on fake accents. It's not a bunch of this and that. Not that there's anything wrong with that as a mode of storytelling or yeah. entertainment, but like, it's just harder to do that, and yet you don't need to do that. Just because you have that doesn't mean you're making a better movie or telling a better story. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of great stories out there that, like you said, like are in our hometowns, small mm -hmm. towns even, rural neighborhoods. Like you know, there might be someone who's 
a, a painter or a craftsperson or a farmer or, you know, uh, an ecologist or something interesting like that, you know, uh, a charity worker or something. Mm -hmm. They might have a great story and you don't need all the fancy special effects and costumes and A-list actors hmm. to tell it. It's just there. So yeah. get that camera rolling, you know? Why, why do you feel, and <coughs> uh, this might be the last question before I see yeah, if anyone yeah, else yeah. has one, but why do, you, why do you feel like storytelling is, is important for us like a, as people, as humans? Oh, um, well, we are naturally inclined to recognize patterns. Um, it has a lot to do with, you know, I, I'm sort of an armchair, like, biology and zoology nerd. So, like, part of it is evolutionary, that it's like, if you can recognize, say, faces and the ex expressions that are remote from faces, you know, mm -hmm. you can navigate the world a little safer, a little more interestingly, a little more accessibly. If you hear something rustling in the bushes, it's, it behooves you to pay attention. So there might be something that wants to eat you. Or, you know, re remember that the red berry is poisonous, but the blue one's okay. You know, like, so we, we naturally look for patterns in nature to survive. And finding patterns is an exciting thing. It can warn us of danger. It can tell us who is our friend or a mate. It can tell us a lot of things. And... It's sort of, there's a thrill-seeking aspect to it, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, the same way that people like ad adrenaline junkies do certain things or, mm -hmm. you know, people who party or something like that or, or who, who people want to travel or something. It's, we have this wanderlust, we have this curiosity, we have a, a, a yearning to be social and telling stories is just something that we do every single day. It's, it, we, 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 we're presented with so much information, mm -hmm. naturally, like not naturally, but uh, routinely, just bombarded with information. Hmm. And documentaries can sometimes be very didactic and informational. We have that expectation historically that documentaries are just, just the facts and very packaged and clinical. Hmm. But um, we are emotional creatures before we're rational beings, for better or for worse. And if something, you know, if I was to tell you, oh, this guy um, wanted to make a big animated movie and he spent 30 years on it and it didn't pan out right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got the information. Right. But if I can present that same anecdote to you in an emotional, narrative-driven way, mm -hmm. you're going to remember it a lot more because we're culturally and naturally inclined to receive stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, you all may go home and, you know, sleep it off, and maybe you loved a movie, maybe you didn't, you maybe have this and that, sort of, but you may not remember the names of the old animators that Richard Williams hired. You may not remember if it was called The Thief and the Cobbler or The Cobbler and the Thief or Nazardin or whatever. Mm. You may not remember if it was supposed to come out in 1992 or 1998 or, nine, or 89 or whatever. You may not remember names or facts or figures or numbers, mm -hmm. but you will remember how you felt. Uh, that could have been elation, it could have been inspiration, it could have been boredom, it could have been mm -hmm. irritation, it could have been a whole mess of things, but we respond to patterns and stories are um, curated patterns that emotionally affect us. Highs and lows, ups and downs, beginning, middles and ends, hmm. you know, happy, you know, generally comedies start with a character who's down in the dumps and then it rises up and we're feeling happy at the end. Mm -hmm. And dramas are usually someone is great and doing awesome and then tragedy befells them and they, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's sad at the end, you know, so we, um, I think, yeah, stories are kind of curated uh, emotional journeys. Hmm. Like, a, like a plot is action. Right. Like plot is, I went to the grocery store, I got some eggs and some milk, uh, and then I went home, and then I relaxed for 20 minutes before I worked. Hmm. That's the plot. The emotional story is I got caught in traffic, I didn't know if I would make it in time, they were all the eggs were smashed, you know, this and that, hmm. and uh, it turns out I left my wallet at home, so I had to scrounge for change in my pockets, you know, this and that, you know, that's, it's more emotionally involved. Hmm. Um, I don't know. It, I'm kind of just doing a lot of guesswork, but uh, well, I, I, I don't I like know. what you're saying, though, because I, I think that's something that, like, like it's, it's interesting that, like, no matter how the technology changes yeah. over the course of, like, human history, it's like we're all drawn toward oh, yeah. connecting and, and hearing each other and, yeah. and kind of seeing those, um, those emotional experiences that you talk We're about. We're always told that, like, stories are, like, these big expensive things where you have to watch five seasons of and catch up on time or watch 
a trilogy of movies to get it. It's like, but the best stories that we experience are like jokes and, and uh, gossip and uh, anecdotes that we share with friends over drinks or at dinner parties. Or mm. that's, that's storytelling at its core. So <laughs> packaging humor and drama mm. and irony and all that good stuff in a film is what I go for. Because I love factual information and true stories. And, but you, it's ultimately a subjective experience. And that's not something to be afraid of as a documentary filmmaker. Mm. That's something to embrace. Because you want people to become emotionally invested. And that, that's kind of what you were saying when you said authenticity is kind of like a, a yeah, tricky word. Cause it's you're tricky. Like, yeah. Because, you know, I could be, say, filming you. Yeah. And it's, all, it's, it's always going to be you. But if I film you from a high angle or mm -hmm. a low angle or really close up or mm -hmm. really far away, or if you're in black and white, or mm -hmm. if you have spooky music behind you right. or silly music behind you or mm -hmm. whatever, it's still you sitting exactly where you are in this room wearing exactly this, you know, outfit and everything. Mm -hmm. But the creative decisions I'm making. My daughter know, picked yeah. up my outfit tonight, by the way. Oh, it looks great, yeah. So I told her I worked designer. that in. I said, I said, if I see a way to work that in, I'll say it. That's great. Yeah. Well, you have a costume designer yeah. at home then, yeah, too. that's right, yeah. Um, so uh, there's always creative decisions that are being made, and I remember being kind of intimidated by that. Like, uh, it, it makes it harder to tell what's true and what's not, but um, it's an experiential Subjective thing, hmm. you know. You have to balance out the subjective truth mm -hmm. with the hard facts, mm -hmm. you know. And that's that's an exciting thing to me, not a scary thing, hmm. like it used to be. Hmm. So cool. Well, I I could probably talk to Kevin for a long time, but yeah. I just want, I want to not hog it all. So I, I don't know if any of you guys have any questions that you want to <coughs> ask. I have one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it had like a story to it. Why couldn't it just have been left as a piece of art without, yeah. having, without having an end or a beginning? Yeah. Because it was, it was beautiful unto itself, right? So sure. And there's something to that that, you know, art, even with if it isn't story driven, can have emotional responses. I mean, you, you know, I was just at the Carnegie this, sun, this uh, Sunday. And, you know, I'm seeing everything. I'm seeing, you know, Rothko, and I'm seeing uh, the Impressionists, and I'm seeing, you know, uh, Herring and Warhol and Japanese prints from the Edo period. And sometimes they tell stories, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just colors or form or whatever. But I think the thing is that when you're dealing with a big company, you know, a canvas of, you know, Rothko's yellow and blue on orange um, is not nearly as risky of an endeavor and an investment as a $28 million, 90-minute animated feature, especially when there's expectations to have merchandising tie-ins and a happy meal and, you know, lunch boxes and action figures. And, you know, it's, you can't imagine having something, unless there was some degree of irony or some sort of corporate sellout feeling. If you, you know, I mean, maybe Warhol would have done it, but I mean, it'd be weird to think of uh, Rembrandt having Happy Meal tie-ins or something. And that's what this Richard Williams guy wanted to make. But when you're making a film like that in a Hollywood setting, there's an expectation that it's not only going to make its money back, which is already a huge gamble, but that it needs to compound that and make all those rich people who invested in it even richer and maybe have spin-offs or sequels or franchising or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, they have all these focus groups and making sure that, you know, kids as young as two and adults as old as 94 or whatever will sit through it and buy the merch and all that other stuff. So, you know, I understand where both parties came from. And I wish we lived in a world where it was okay to just spend that kind of time and money and resources on art for art's sake. But um, when you're involved in a Hollywood setting like that, you're making a product. And a product has to sell. Uh, it can't just be pretty. It can't just be interesting. It can't just be novel. It can't just be powerful. It has to sell. And uh, I don't think he liked that aspect of it. And I don't like that aspect of it. But I 
you know, have somehow, I mean, I do commercial work too, of course, but like I've somehow, I work, I work in a kind of filmmaking landscape that isn't as expensive as making a giant animated feature um, where it has that kind of contractual expectation, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was a bunch of anecdotes. This is for anyone who doesn't know. This was a, a film in the '80s made by I think Nelvana or some Canadian animation studio, um, and it's a bunch of vignettes. Some of them are like silly. Some of them are like horror. Some of them are like kind of sexy. They're all like kind of science fiction and sort of like drug influenced or whatever. But. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think if The Thief and the Cobbler had been finished, it probably would have had a cult following like heavy metal. Um, uh, and that's, I think, what most artists aim for, is like, the right people will like this thing for the right reason. And that's what I tell myself, too, you know? Like, ah, oh, not everyone's going to like it, but the right people will. It's like that thing in Seinfeld where, like, George makes some joke and everyone else at the diner doesn't get it. And he's like, it's smart. It's a smart joke that smart people will appreciate. It's that kind of a thing. And for a lot of people, that's good enough if you just want to be a storyteller and a creator. But again, if you have tens of millions of dollars riding on this thing and all these suits, you know, and these, these corporate tie-ins, they're not interested in whether you get, you know, you have 200 nerds love it. They want a billion people to buy it, you know? I, I think it's just, I think, I think people just are, I, I think people, I think it's more just that people are in the cave. They're not necessarily stupid or, or less curious or anything. Um, I think, so I'll go on another tangent. You guys have dealt with so many, so but I'll go on another one. Um, the, I think you're kind of getting at something about like commodification of movies and stuff and storytelling. Maybe the elephant in the room is something like the Marvel movies, right? Like, and you hear all this discourse these days of like, oh, the only movie theaters, movie theaters are going to die out. And if they're going to exist at all, it's only going to be to showcase the big Star Wars or Marvel or DC comic book movies or whatever these, these franchises are. There's going to be tentpole attractions and it's just going to be all filler and special effects and this sort of thing. And people are freaked out about it. But um, the analogy that I really like with, say, something like Marvel, which is, you know, a product is and an entertaining one for a lot of people is that it's kind of like McDonald's. It's like, it's a very carefully crafted, workshopped uh, product that a lot of people like the taste of. You know exactly what you're getting every time you go. And you're probably not going to be disappointed by it because you know exactly what you're expecting. And because of that, it makes its returns. It makes its money back. And it's accessible. People all over the world enjoy that because they've figured out how to make something that a lot of people like. It doesn't take a lot of, you know, you don't have to be scratching your head and watch it a second time to understand it. Or if you miss three minutes of it from going to the bathroom, you're, you're not going to be like, wait, wait, what's happening? You know what's happening every single time. The, the good guy is going to win, you know, and they'll say some funny stuff along the way. And something's going to blow up. Um, but that's because like a Big Mac or something, it's a formula. They figured it out. And there's nothing wrong with formulas that work. But I think a lot of people know that you can't just eat McDonald's. If, you, if you're raised only on McDonald's, then of course you're going to keep eating McDonald's. But I think, I, think, I think people aren't nearly as dumb as we think. I think it's just that we, we keep being told that, oh, movie theaters are going to die out, and indie films are on the way out, and it's all going to be these big tentpole attractions. But that's not because of, you know, us. It's not because of ordinary people. Although it, I think ordinary people, if they do care about seeing indie movies or smaller things or works of art, then it is on them to seek it out and put their money where their mouth is and go see it opening weekend and see it in the movie theater and buy the DVD or buy the Blu-ray or, you know, contribute to the crowdfunding campaign or, or go to the art opening or, go, or donate some money to the charity. It's important to put your money where your mouth is, of course. But it's really, you know, the guys in suits that are calling those shots. But they're only calling those shots because they see what makes money. And again, they're only 
they're under the impression that the only things that are making money are these big comic book temple attractions because that's the only thing that they're willing to risk money on. But once in a while, you get something that breaks the mold, you know? Like the Barbie movie was huge because, like, you had this brilliant, one of our best American filmmakers alive today, Greta Gerwig, and she gave this really interesting postmodern but sincere uh, feminist spin on uh, a, a Western cultural monolith. And it was a massive hit, culturally, commercially. And the guys in suits are like, well, this was a big hit. Let's make a hundred more of these things. <laughs> They're missing, they don't know what they've created. They, you know, they don't, people don't want a hundred more Barbie movies. They want a hundred more movies that speak to them, that are funny, that touch them in the right way, that surprise them. And as goofy as a Barbie movie might be, it, it did that for a lot of people. Um, and that happens all the time, but I, it just, I, don't, I, think, I think those things kind of get ignored. But it is, it is on us to have a more well-rounded diet, to keep the McDonald's analogy further, you know? Have, sometimes it's going to be more expensive, or maybe not your flavor, or a little too spicy for you, but you have to be adventurous, you know, and see. More, more show. Yeah. But independent films. I mean, yeah. I, luckily, I spent 10 years living in LA where I was literally a mile or two miles yeah. from the Lemley Theater. Yeah. I could go there, and I did, like, because I would just show up as I had every yeah. day. I just show up and say, I'll take a ticket to the next movie that's playing. Mm -hmm. And everything they showed was fabulous. Yeah. Um, but we don't have that around here. You know, it's you know, harder, so yeah. Hard. But that's all the more reason to support each other locally. I mean, the fact that you all showed up to this is just very encouraging because you could have been doing something else on a Wednesday night, you know? And it was a nice night out there. And, you know, you had to drive a distance and, you know, just maybe get a babysitter or maybe whatever, you know? But Oh, yeah. Lindsay, yeah. That's a great space. They do. They showed, and I went to the screen, and they showed the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It's a 103 year old German expressionist silent horror movie. They had a three piece band. Uh, it's, well, you know, tinted, but essentially a black and white old silent movie. Sold out show. People want to see. Novelty. They just need to be reminded that it's there, and they need to then, on their end, support it. Go opening weekend, you know. Uh, pay admission, like, you know, plan that night around that thing. Make a party of it. Bring friends, you know. Make that be your first stop, and then get drinks or dinner afterwards, you know, and, and then just make it a social thing. But, and you guys are already doing that, which is really encouraging. But um, it's sort of like, like voting or recycling or something. Maybe one of us can't do a whole lot. But if enough of us do it, it adds up, you know? It, 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 it's, that's how any movement happens, you know? Well, I have a, a shameless plug and then a question. But, yeah. um, the Genesis Collective is actually working with another local organization great. to produce an independent film festival oh, in great. 2025. So you're invited, excuse me, you're invited back for that. Well, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> we'll have something new by then, hopefully. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd yeah, love to talk about that. I'll send you the link when it's available. Well, hopefully. <laughs> I, I have that Antarctic thing. Maybe that'll be ready by then or something. Yeah. Yeah. My question is kind of following what Danny was asking about yeah. um, about the craft and can it just stand, you know, and and as it is, and rather than being a commercial thing. Yeah. Um, and you gave you know a really eloquent answer to that, but Richard Williams went on and on and on about, yeah. and I know that's all curated, but he <laughs> if he said it twice in the film. Mm -hmm. That he's a craftsman. This yeah. is a craft. He was like desperate to make sure everyone knew mm -hmm. this is a legitimate art form. I'm an old craftsman. This is the. Yeah. Do you believe him when he said, I'm dying oh, to yeah. finish this film? 
Oh, if he was dying to finish it. Oh. I feel like he just, he just wanted to do it. I think and I suspect funders, that, too. Here's my theory. Yeah. That all of the funders, yeah, whatever, we're just going to work, 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 until the rug was pulled out. You can't work anymore. Well, if you're, I think he was, a, in, in many ways, a real perfectionist. And a real, perf you know, people say, oh, I'm a perfectionist. I'm never satisfied. A real perfectionist genuinely is never satisfied. Yeah. And if they're happy with what they've done, they know they can do better. Mm -hmm. and that's what he kept doing. He kept either complicating scenes or expanding scenes or, you know, obsessively whittle, you know, messing with them. I, I think he did want to finish it because then he, he would have it done, but I think it was hard to do that. I think it was more comfortable just working on it because then you can keep chasing that ideal right. result. It'll never, because, and I know this with, with when you put out your own film, and I'm, there's people who are, here who are creative and make things too, whether it's, you know, ceramics or music or m movies or something, you know, but like once it's out there, it's kind of no longer yours. And it's everybody else to decide whether it's any good. You know, like, uh, yeah, it wasn't bad. Uh, sl uh, slowed down a little bit in the middle. Or, yeah, it wasn't crazy about that music cue. Or so-and-so was, you know, uh, the lighting was a little off there. Or whatever the, whatever the thing might be. And those might be legitimate criticisms. But it, they're never fun to hear <laughs> when you spend so much time and so much money. And they can be educational. You can become a better artist hearing legitimate criticism. But when you're toiling on something for a quarter of a century plus, it's really hard to abandon it then. You're gestating it for so long. So I do think he mentally wanted to get it done, but it's a lot harder to do that emotionally. Yeah. You know, yeah. Have you had that experience with, with your own filmmaking where you're kind of like, like finding yourself like, when, when am I done with this? Or are you like, um, okay, it's done? Actually, I haven't really. Um, and it's not because I think, oh, I'm doing so great. It's going to be, everyone's going to love this. It's not that. It's just that, it's just that I know I have to rip off that Band-Aid eventually. Um, and uh, I also know that I'm not really a filmmaker unless I have actually made a film. <laughs> you know? Sense, yeah. like, and I'm not, I'm not trying to do a slight toward him, but yeah. it's like, because he actually made films too, even before, even without the Thieving the Cobbler. He was a filmmaker. He was a real artist. He was a real craftsman. Mm -hmm. But um, he wouldn't have even had to have done that to prove it. But... Um, yeah, like the Inongo film is like is, is a very slow motion process because a pandemic happened and it kind of got in the way. Um, and also, but you know, and the animation that the amazing team is working on on that, um, you know, y you can aspire to have three things when you're making, say, art or animation. You can, you can want it to be. People always want it to be affordable. They want it to be excellent, and they want it to be produced fast. You can never have all three of those things. Yeah. You can maybe have two if you're lucky. So I've been lucky enough to have two of those things satisfied, that it's excellent and that it's affordable. Mm -hmm. But that means it's moving at an incredibly slow pace. But yeah. that's okay because we had a pandemic for three years. Nothing was really happening except what we could accomplish at home. Mm -hmm. So that let us kind of regroup. And you just have to adapt. A lot of being an independent filmmaker is adapting and not being too stubborn. So. I don't usually have that issue of, of, oh, I'm not ready to put it out there in the world. I do want to put what I make out into the world, but I'm always uncomfortable when it's out there. Like, I, I wasn't here for the screening mm. for 90% of it. Um, I, I know almost the whole movie by, you know, by memory, so I kind of knew exactly what scene it, I would be dropping in on if I walked in, you know, an hour and three minutes in or something, mm. whenever, I, whenever I came in. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's what I, what I guess what I, I don't fear about completing something is that I want it to be shared. I want, I want to make things that other people will respond to because I'm essentially like trying to tell a story that I really like and uh, the only way to really have a story be told if, it's, if there's an audience, you know, mm -hmm. so, and have that transmit.